Okay, good evening everyone. This is Dr. Mahesh from Naidu. I'm doing a live stream broadcast this evening um, from 7 to 8. Uh, the topics are going to be that are going to be covered this evening include a number of very interesting topics, uh, namely esophageal melanoma, small bowel gist, retroperitoneal mass, as well as an upper segment DVT. Um, I would um, like you to please interact as much as possible, um, ask questions. I will try and ask a few questions and um, if we have uh, responses via WhatsApp, um, that would be great. Okay, so we're going to start with the first topic, uh, which was presented uh, in 2019 to by Dr. N. Global. The index patient was a 54-year-old uh, Mr. G.S. He complained of worsening dysphagia for solids over a three-month period. There was no medical or surgical history of note. He was a non-smoker with an active lifestyle, and he had presented to the casualty department. He um, underwent uh, an upper GI endoscopy, and um, the stomach and duodenum was fine. However, in the esophagus, at about 30 centimeters from the incisors, the following lesion was noted as per the endoscopic pictures. Unusual looking lesion, uh, not a typical uh, malignant stricture that we are used to with the squamous cell carcinoma. Biopsies were taken and uh, the histology initially showed an undifferentiated carcinoma. So this um, obviously confused us a bit. And the H&E stains uh, just showed giant and bizarre malignant cells, um, but the histopathologist could not initially uh, confirm the source of these malignant cells. Staging CT confirmed a large subcarinal mass with esophageal displacement, right hyla and subcarinal as well as paraaortic nodes, and there was an isolated right lung nodule. There were no liver meds noted. The differential diagnosis at this point in time included a poorly differentiated carcinoma, possibly squamous, adeno, or large cell NEC, um, an undifferentiated carcinoma, a GIST tumor, leiomyosarcoma, a perivascular epithelioid cell tumor, um, melanoma, primary or secondary, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Okay, the histopathologists did some additional stains and they were thus able to confirm melanocytic differentiation. And uh, these are the histopathological pictures um, shown on this slide. So, um, going into um, primary malignant melanoma of the esophagus, abbreviated to PMME, it occurs in the melanin sites, sorry, melanin or melanin cells of the esophageal mucosal epithelial basal layer. Uh, it was first described by Bauer in 1906, typically occurs in the mid to lower thoracic esophagus. Remember, this lesion was at uh, 30 centimeters, which uh, is in the distal third. And the greater concentration of melanocytes are found in this particular region. Epidemiology, male to female ratio is two to one. It's prevalent in the sixth and seventh decades of life. It is quite rare, less than 1% of all esophageal neoplasms. And 41% of patients have metastases at the time of diagnosis. Uh, typical presentation, symptomatic history, mean of 3.5 months before diagnos diagnosis is established. Dysphagia, uh, retrosternal or epigastric discomfort uh, or pain. There may be melina stool, hematemesis, and um, weight loss is surprisingly uncommon. Pathogenesis, growth in the mucosal and submucosal layers. There is infiltration beyond the esophageal wall. Um, sorry, infiltration beyond the esophageal wall is uncommon. 
tendency for vertical growth within the esophageal wall. Lymphatic and vascular invasion is common and 30% present with lymph node involvement or metastases to different sites as was the case in our index patient. Um, the investigations uh, as was done in this patient was endoscopy, typically polypoid lesions which are usually pigmented as shown on the um, endoscopic photograph on the right from uh, a journal article as per the reference. The um, lesion is typically lobulate, lobulated, darkly colored, uh, the mucosa is intact or it may be ulcerated as was the case in our patient. Diagnostic criteria for accepting a melanoma as rising from the esophagus, there must be a presence of melanin granules within the tumor, melanocytes in overlying epithelial layer, and the areas of junctional activity with squamous mucosa and adjacent epithelium. Uh, immunohistochemical stainings uh, can assist positive antibody specific cytoplasmic reactivity to HMB45, which is short for human melanoma black and S100 proteins, negative for cytokeratin and carcinoembryonic antigen. The CT um, may, dis as was the case in this patient, may demonstrate bulky esophageal mass compressing the adjacent mediastinal structures. There may be mediastinal invasion, nodal enlargement, and distant metastatic disease. PET CT scan is useful. Um, PET CT has been established in staging and follow-up follow of malignant melanoma. It highlights metastases at unusual sites that are missed with conventional imaging modalities. With regard to management for primary malignant melanoma of the esophagus, it is surgical resection. Total esophagectomy is recommended. Radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and immune therapy are controversial. Newer angiogen therapies include brachytherapy, which is showing promising potential. Nonetheless, the overall prognosis is poor with a low uh, one-year survival reported. Conclusion, um, the polypoidal tumor on endoscopy, um, rare conditions that may pose diagnostic difficulty uh, include non-pigmented or no melanin granules, which will cause um, diagnostic dilemma. And then it has a similar presentation to squamous cell carcinoma. It is aggressive with a poor prognosis. Okay, these are the references listed. If there are any questions, um, please can you submit them via WhatsApp. Okay, we will now move on to the next uh, topic, which is a small bowel gist tumor, gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And this uh, presentation is courtesy of Dr. P. Harichanda. Okay, this index patient had an an upper GI endoscopy which showed a lesion and endoscopic ultrasound confirmed a mass lesion adjacent to the lumen of the bowel. A CT scan was done uh, which showed an abnormality uh, in vague abnormality in the, in the bowel uh, not very easy to see and there it is there um, this was a solid mass. And at diagnostic laparoscopy, a fairly large uh, tumor was found in the bowel wall. Uh, the mass was removed through a um, subumbilical vertical incision. And this is what it looked like macroscopically. The histology. Um, confirmed a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, four centimeters in maximum dimension, and no mitotic figures are seen, uh, which um, is typical of GIST tumors. They are relatively um, low uh, in uh, virulence. 
Give us a little bit of information about uh, GIS tumors. Median age of these patients are 65. Incidence is about 11 to 14 per million population per annum. Um, 0.1 to 3 percent of all GIT malignant tumors. They are considered malignant, but they are of uh, lesser aggressive nature. They are associated with certain syndromes, which include Carney Stratakis syndrome, neurofibromatosis type 1. GIST in these particular patients usually present in the small bowel. There is a possibility of a familial GIST uh, syndrome, and then they are also associated with desmoid tumors. Typical sites, uh, the gastric or stomach is commonest at 65%. Second commonest is small bowel at 25%. Then in decreasing uh, uh, incidence, it's the esophagus, colon, and rectum. And lastly, the mesentery. Pathogenesis, the interstitial cells of Kajal are called pacemaker cells. Um, Histologically, 70% are spindle type, 20% are epithelial type, epithelioid type, and 10% are the mixed type. Genetic mutations, you get a KIT mutation, CD117, which is in, present in 90% of cases. Uh, PDGR, FRA gene mutation, NF1 gene mutation, and BRAF mutations are all associated with GIST tumors. Clinical features, 70% are symptomatic, depends on the location and size. They present with GI symptoms, constitutional symptoms, as well as evidence of metastatic disease. 20% are incidental findings on imaging and 10% are noted on, at autopsy. Endoscopic investigations uh, include an upper GI endoscopy, primary gastric or duodenal gists, and synchronous or metastatic gists may be detected. Endoscopic ultrasound and endoscopic ultrasound combined with fine needle aspiration. Okay, in terms of assisting uh, malignant risks, there are a number of uh, parameters that are considered, the tumor size, um, the mitotic rate, uh, gastric, uh, the site basically, gastric versus jejunal, ileal, duodenal, and rectal. So in our particular patient, it was between greater than 2 and less than 5 centimeters. Remember, it was 4 centimeters in its greatest dimension and the risk of malignant see, malignancy is was only 4.3 percent. Treatment. Um, nowadays there's a lot of medical treatment that is available. This includes neoadjuvant uh, imitinib. Uh, second line treat treatment is sunitinib. Third line treatment is a whole lot of difficult to pronounce names which I shall not attempt to pronounce. The um, reference is available on this slide. And just to bear in mind that the um, uh, these drugs are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Okay. Now, surgery is recommended um, to, and one should do a R0 resection, which is a complete resection. Um, the options are open versus laparoscopic. No lymph node dissection is routinely carried out, and adjuvant therapy is usually recommended. Surveillance, there are no generally accepted guidelines. Uh, it's done according to risk stratification, um, high risk without adjuvant therapy, uh, three to four months, monthly to two years, and annual imaging for 10 years. High risk with adjuvant therapy, then in six monthly um, follow up is recommended, uh, three to four months for two years after treatment, and annual imaging for 10 years. Intermediate or less annual CT abdomen for five years. Um, okay, uh, that brings us to the end of the second presentation. If there are any questions, uh, please um, submit them on WhatsApp. Okay, we're going on to our third presentation now, uh, a retroperitoneal mass, which was uh, this presentation is courtesy of Dr. S. Covender.
Okay, the index patient was a 20-year-old female, had a progressively enlarging abdominal mass for one year. No uh, past medical history of note. RVD test was negative. Pregnancy test was negative. Past surgical history, exploratory laparotomy by uh, the gynae team at Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Hospital in August 2018 for suspected ovarian torsion. Intraop findings were large retroperitoneal mass involving the right pelvic sidewall and the um, patient was closed and then referred to general surgery. At examination, this patient um, had a lower midline incision, um, distended abdomen, was not peritonitic. There was a large, firm, non-pulsatile mass extending to the ziphy sternum. Um, as a sinus in the lower aspect of the previous incision draining turbid fluid. The blood results uh, showed an elevated ESR of 70, CA125 was 22, alpha fetal protein was less than 1.3, CD active protein was elevated at 280. Uh, the rest of the results were not remarkable. CT scan of the abdomen uh, revealed a large retroperitoneal mass predominantly on the right with extension across. Uh, the abdomen to the left, it was measured 18.3 by 10.5 by 17 centimeters. Okay, these are pictures, uh, CT images from this patient. A biopsy of the pelvic wall was done. Uh, this revealed, uh, this was done during the gynae procedure. Organizing abscess, there was no evidence of TB, no specific stromal uh, chronic inflammation was noted. An appendectomy had been done at that time. It showed fibrinoparulin peritonitis and cirrhosal fibrosis. There was no tumor noted in the appendix and there was no evidence of malignancy. Uh, subsequently, an ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration was done, but this only revealed blood and amorphous debris. The plan was for an exploratory laparotomy with open biopsy with or without excision, depending on the intraop findings. Okay, this is an intraoperative picture from this patient. There's a large retroperitoneal mass arising from the inferior cecal pole. Um, the cecum is identified by the blue arrow, terminal ileum here, and this huge mass inferior to the cecum and ileum. There's no ureteric involvement, no bowel obstruction. Terminal ileum and cecum were densely adherent to the mass. This was all resected. The patient had a limited right hemicolectomy and a stapled ileocolic anastomosis was done. Post-op course was uneventful. Okay, so what is the approach to retroperitoneal masses? They are a diagnostic dilemma. Masses in close proximity to vital structures and they usually present late. Often they have reached a significant size before they become palpable and because they are, tend to be in the retroperitoneum or they are in the retroperitoneum by definition, they tend not to cause obstruction or uh, compression until uh, they are quite advanced in size. The anatomy of the retroperitoneum it is divided into a perirenal space, PRS, that's this yellow showed in the slide, two spaces left and right, anterior perirenal space, right, which is um, here in line with the pancreas, ascending and descending colon, and then the posterior perirenal space, PPS, which is the purple layer here. Okay, so it's important um, to actually understand the anatomy of the retroperitoneum. Remember perirenal space, anterior pararenal space, and posterior pararenal space. So PRS, APS, and PPS. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Anteriorly, um, there's the peritoneum, ipsilateral colon, and mesocolon, pancreas, liver, and stomach. 
Posterior margins are related to the psoas muscle, quadratus lumbarum muscle, transversus abdominis, and the iliacus muscles as you get down into the pelvis. Superiorly is the diaphragm, and inferiorly is the pelvis. Uh, typical presentation, the symptoms include abdominal swelling, early satiety, abdominal satiety, gastrointestinal or urinary symptoms are unusual. Remember what I said about uh, obstruction because it's retroperitoneal is uncommon. They may, however, have back pain and constitutional symptoms. And the most obvious sign only um, possible to elicit when the mass is large enough is a palpable mass. Differential diagnosis uh, includes solid neoplastic masses in the retroperitoneum, and these can be broadly divided into four groups, mesodermal tumors, neurogenic tumors, germ cell and stromal, germ cell stromal tumors, and lymphoid hematological neoplasms. Malignant tumors are four times more frequent than benign lesions in the retroperitoneum. Sarcoma is approximately one, make up one third of retroperitoneal tumors, and two histological subtypes to predominate. This includes a liposarcoma and a leiomyosarcoma. Uh, the, in the retroperitoneum, the second most common site of origin of malignant mesenchymal tumors after the lower extremity. Okay, the typical soft tissue tumors that we see in the lower extremity. Second commonest site is the retroperitoneum. Uh, sarcomas have a wor worse prognosis than extremity sarcoma. Um, retroperitoneal sarcoma, five year survival rate is between 39 and 68%. Most common benign tumors tend to be neurogenic. Investigations, FPC, you may pick up anemia. Random glucose, you may pick up hypoglycemia. UNE, serum creatinine may be raised if the ureter or kidney is compressed. And then the tumor markers to monitor are AFP, beta HCG, and LDH. Radiological investigations, contrast enhanced CT is the imaging of choice. Histologically, preoperative histology by core needle biopsy is required when imaging is not diagnostic. The management in com includes complete margin resection and depends on tumor biology, size of the lesion, and invasion of adjacent organs. Complete surgical resection, only potential for curative treatment in retroperitoneal sarcomas. Resection of adjacent organs such as small bowel, colon, or kidney is often required. Surgery is best performed in high volume centers with a multidisciplinary sarcoma team. Relative contraindications for surgery tumor invading vena cava or iliac vessels, involvement of the aorta, involvement of the spinal cord or lumbar sacral plexus, multiple distant metastases, gross peritoneal invasion. And getting back to our index patient, this was the resected mass. Um, the findings were squamous epithelium with granulation tissue, mixed acute and chronic inflammation and fibrosis noted, granulomas not identified, no AFPs, no evidence of malignancy noted. So it was basically predominantly squamous epithelium. Just a note on retroperitoneal fibrosis. Retroperitoneal fibrosis, also known as hormones disease, is a rare condition associated with collagen vascular disease, characterized by chronic nonspecific inflammation of the retroperitoneum. Like autoimmune diseases in origin, IgG4 related retroperitoneal fibrosis, um, tumors may result in compression of abdominal organs. Uh, males often between the ages of 40 to 60 are affected. Retroperitoneal fibrosis is associated with conditions such as tuberculosis, actinomycosis, histoplasmosis, recent trauma of the abdomen or pelvis, abdominal or pelvic tumors, recent abdominal or pelvic surgery, uh, use of external beam radiation. 
Treatment varies depending on severity and location of the fibrosis. In the early stages, you can try anti-inflammatories, corticosteroids, and immune suppressants. And the long-term prognosis is good if the diagnosis is made early. In summary, retroperitoneum can host a wide spectrum of rare pathologies. Tumors usually present late and cause symptoms or become palpable once they have reached a significant size. Best evaluated with cross-sectional imaging. Preoperative histology by core needle biopsy is required when imaging is not diagnostic. Complete surgical resection is the only potential curative treatment modality for retroperitoneal sarcoma. Okay, if there are any questions, please post them on WhatsApp. Approach to the retroperitoneal mass. This is just an algorithm to assist you. De start with a detailed history and complete clinical examination, including nodal basins and testicular exam. Blood tests would include a full blood count, UNE, beta-HCG, and AFP uh, for germ cell tumors, then LDH for lymphomas. Imaging, uh, try a CT abdomen to assess the extent of the tumor, MRI and geography to assess vascular anatomy, and thoracic CC, CT to assess for lung metastases. Biopsies can be ultrasound or CT guided using a core needle. Open biopsy may be incisional or excisional, uh, complete surgical resection or end block resection. If it is the histology is benign, management is tailored according to the histology. If the malignant, if histology is malignant and it's a sarcoma, it um, can it should be assessed as resectable or irresectable, whether there was a complete resection or excision, and then you could consider neoadjuvant therapy. <coughs> These are the references. And we're now going to move on to our final topic. Um, if there's any questions, I haven't had much interaction this evening. Please feel free. The last presentation is courtesy of Dr. Mahula Ramapoko, and this is of an upper patient with an upper limb DVT. The index patient was a 59-year-old female patient with diabetes and hypertension, uh, three-week history, left-sided upper limb swelling, and a six-month history of left breast pain, asymmetry, and undergoing workup for breast cancer. On examination, the left breast was enlarged compared to the right. Breast uh, retracted superiorly and fixed to pec uh, fascia. The nipple was retracted and there was extensive port orange. There was no overtly palpable breast mass. Dilated superficial veins on the neck, chest wall, there was no plethora. Um, palpable bilateral axillary nodes as well as a left supraclavicular node were noted. Fine needle aspiration biopsy of the left axillary node showed malignant cells in keeping with carcinoma. Extensive swelling of the left upper limb. The patient was unable to abduct or elevate the limb due to lymphedema. DVT was suspected as a possible cause as well. Uh, pulses are normal and equal compared to the right. It's a clinical picture of the patient. You can see the uh, breast was retracted, uh, slightly shrunken. There's extensive powder range and uh, it was extending onto the um, supraclavicular area. The arm was also edematous and swollen, suggestive more of a lymphedema type of picture. Investigations that were done included a venous duplex Doppler. This showed a non-occlusive clot in the axillary vein and a semi-organized occlusive thrombus in the left brachial artery. Epidemiology of this condition, thrombosis in the axillary, subclavian and brachial veins, represents less than 10% of patients with DVT, uh, primary versus secondary, and the incidence of primary is one to two per 100,000. Uh, VTE with no other risk factors, with, there's a 10% uh, likelihood of cancer. Uh, primary 
causes uh, thoracic outlet obstruction, for example, effort-related thrombosis, paget schroeter syndrome, or alternatively, it may be idiopathic. Secondary causes, 66 to 88% of upper limb DVT, uh, may be related to central venous catheters, trauma to the shoulder, hypercoagulable state, for example, malignancy, and orthopedic operation with the use of a tourniquet. Investigations include Wells criteria from 2003, X-ray, D-dimer, duplex ultrasound, contrast venogram, and MRI. Effort-related thrombosis this is responsible for 10 to 20 percent of upper limb DVTs, thoracic outlet abnormality and repetitive arm movements, for example, bowlers, boxes, and sports which involve uh, movement up around the shoulder joint and upper limb. Pathogenesis movement leads to internal internal tears due to mechanical stimuli, and this promotes thrombus formation. Also, a hypertrophied anterior scalene and subclavius muscles result in compression and stasis in the vessel. Management of upper limb of um, PSS is anticoagulation, catheter-directed thrombol thrombolysis in some cases, and resection of the first trip can be justified in very specific cases. Then we come to thoracic outlet syndrome, signs and symptoms attributable to compression on neurovascular bundle in the thoracic outlet region. Um, NTOS is most common, arterial and venous subtypes only 3% and less than 1%. Um, respectively. Venous th uh, thoracic outlet syndrome associated with high long-term morbidity and disability. Treatment includes combining anticoagulation with thrombolysis, decompression, wow. and venoplasty. More than 70% with persistent or recurrent symptoms when treated with can anticoagulation only. What anticoagulation? Start both low molecular weight heparin and vitamin K antagonists, that's warfarin. Stop low molecular weight heparin at five days. This is pretty much the same as the um, anticoagulation protocols for lower limb DVT. Just to bear in mind that anticoagulation does not prevent post-traumatic syndrome. Anticoagulation, direct oral anticoagulants are the anticoagulants of choice. They're contraindicated in malignancy and there are no antidotes available. Superior vena cava filters used when anticoagulation is contraindicated and there is evidence of pulmonary embolism. Anticoagulation at least three months in unprovoked cases continued until known etiology has resolved and lifelong if there is a recurrence or intractable cause. What about thrombolysis? It's not recommended for routine use. It is recommended for low risk of bleeding with severe symptoms, younger patients, good functional status, life expectancy of more than one year, um, the dominant hand is involved, or if the patients are not responding to anticoagulation. Thrombolysis involves catheter-directed uh, versus pharmacomechanical thrombolysis, similar clinical results, um, pharmacomechanical thrombolysis shows a short length of stay and cost effective. Systemic thrombolysis in patients may be beneficial if they have pulmonary embolus. The index patient, um, shown the details of previously, is currently on Clexane, 80 milligrams PD, analgesia, and she's awaiting histology results. And these are the references. That uh, brings us to the end of today's presentation. Those are four very interesting presentations. Um, these are cases that are presented to um, the various surgical teams uh, and Durban. And um, if there are any questions, please submit them by WhatsApp. Um, I um, have actually run through all the operative topics previously and uh, I did not want to repeat them. Um, if there are any topics in particular that you would like me to talk on, please uh, contact me, email, uh, call me or WhatsApp me, and um, I will be uh, happy to oblige.
Thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in. Good night. Have a good evening to all of those people writing tomorrow and uh, Friday, uh, Thursday and Friday, sorry. Uh, all the very best of luck. And um, I hope you all get invited to the Viva. Good night.